age of a tree can be estimated by? Complete that sentence and that's your new question. Okay. Any idea how you can guess the age of a tree? Do you know the answer? Well, when you cut a tree, please don't do that. Even I'm absolutely against just like you, you know, against cutting off trees. But just in case you do cut a tree or you see a tree that is cut, what do you find in the stump or, you know, in the trunk of the tree? You will find rings, you know, beautiful ring-like patterns. Each ring corresponds to its growth. So we call it as the growth rings or the annual rings. By counting the number of rings, we can give the age of the plant. And you know what's the terminology, the scientific term for that? To count the number of growth rings and give the age of the plant? I'm going to write it, try and pronounce it. It is called as dendro chronology. Long word for a very important feature. So now let's come back to the options. Age of a tree can be estimated by its height and girth. Girth is the width. No. The number of annual rings. Yes, that is the right answer. It's biomass. No, definitely not by the biomass or the diameter of the heartwood. Definitely not the heartwood. Heartwood is the dark wood that you find in a tree. Can you see these rings? These beautiful lines. That's the annual rings. Age of a tree can be estimated by counting the number of annual rings in a cut stem. The two kinds of wood, that is a spring wood and the autumn wood, appear as alternate concentric rings of light and dark color, respectively. Thus, one annual ring comprises of one circle of spring wood, which is lighter in color, and the autumn wood, which is darker in color. In So, both of them is what con constitutes a growth ring. One annual ring corresponds to one year. The science of counting and the analysis of the annual growth rings of the trees is called as dendrochronology. So the correct answer, the age of a tree can be estimated by the number of the annual rings. Let us now look at this question. Heartwood differs from sapwood. Now what is heartwood? Heartwood is the dark colored wood. Okay. Whereas sapwood is the light colored wood. In fact, sapwood is also called as alburnum. And heartwood is also called as duramen. Now, heartwood is darker in color. Sapwood is lighter in color. Heartwood, in fact, represents the xylem vessels which have become non-functional. Why? Because of the deposits of, you know, substances like tannins, resins, gums. Now, these are highly resistant to microbial infections. They are very good. In fact, you know, they are durable and they can be used to make furniture. But they are not participating in the active conduction of water like xylem is expo uh, expected to do. Okay, so this here, it is completely dead. The parenchyma also dies in this. So, it's a non-functional xylem which in fact is resistant to a number of microbial pathogens. So let us look at the options. Heartwood differs from sapwood in being susceptible to pests and pathogens. No, it is highly resistant. This is wrong. Presence of rays and fibers. No, you do not find rays and fibers in heartwood. Absence of vessels and parenchyma. Again, you do find vessels, but they are, you know, they are non-conducting. You do not have them conducting like functional. So again, this is wrong. Having, so it is present, but they are dead. Parakama is present, but it is dead. Having dead and non-conducting elements. Yes, they have dead and non-conducting elements. Why? Like I told you, deposition of a number of substances. So you can see the dark wood that you can see is the heartwood and the light wood is the sap wood. The older woody stems tend to show two distinct regions. The outer light colored and functional sap wood, also called as alburnum. Or the inner darker and non-functional wood, that is heartwood or the duramen. The inner zone gets dark due to the progressive deposition of organic compounds like resins, gums, tannins, etc. And essential oils in vessels and tracheids of the secondary, the older secondary xylem, that is wood. Cells of heartwood are lignified which makes it stronger and durable. Some of these substances can also function as antiseptic which 
makes it further resistant to pathogens. These depositions result in blockage of xylary elements due to which water is not conducted. So vessels are present that become non-functional and parenchyma dies soon after the heartwood formation. The formation of heartwood causes the death of ray cells. The conduction of water and minerals dissolved in it is performed by periphery lo peripherally located younger sapwood. Sapwood shows the presence of ray cells and fibers. A part, uh, a part of the sapwood has conducting function and has part of it has storage function. So the correct answer is having dead and non-conducting elements. Let us now solve this question. What is the fate of primary xylem in a dicot root showing extensive secondary growth? Secondary growth is a phenomenon that we see very commonly in dicot plants. Dicot stem has cambium in it. Dicot root develops the cambium that is a secondary meristem much later in its growth period. Okay. Now, Secondary meristem is what gives rise to the secondary permanent tissues like secondary xylem and secondary phloem. Between xylem and phloem, okay, now when you look at the steel, when you take look at the anatomy of a root, you see that the, of course, you have the xylem and you have the phloem present here. Now, what happens is that during secondary growth, as more and more xylem keeps getting added, Xylem being harder, you know, compared to phloem, xylem is hard. The phloem gets pushed. Phloem gets pushed to an extent where the phloem can get crushed. Secondary phloem gets added, primary phloem gets crushed, secondary phloem also get push, gets pushed. What happens to the primary xylem? Well, more and more xylem getting added, the primary xylem, in fact, gets pushed towards the center. It gets pushed towards the center. That's what happens to primary xylem. It doesn't get crushed. Because xylem is hard compared to phloem. So, let us look at the answer. The primary xylem, what is the fate of primary xylem in a dicot root? It is retained in the center of the axis. Yes, this is the right answer. It gets crushed. No. May or may not get crushed. No, it does not get crushed. It gets surrounded by primary phloem. No, it does not get surrounded by primary phloem because primary phloem gets crushed. This is a diagrammatic representation, what you can see of the primary growth and the secondary growth in a dicot root. In the case of excessive secondary growth, the continuous addition of layers of secondary xylem on the inner, inner side and the layers of secondary phloem are produced on the outer side. The primary phloem along with some part of outer secondary phloem gets crushed as new phloem keeps on developing. The primary xylem remains more or less intact and retained in the center of the axis. However, due to the pressure of the newly formed adjoining tissues, the primary xylem may stop growing or rather it starts increasing. So, the right answer, it is retained in the center of the axis. It does not get crushed. Let us now look at this question. The periderm includes, what is a periderm? Before I go into the option, well, the periderm is again part of secondary growth. Okay. So, we all know what is secondary growth. The increase in the girth of the shoot axis and also the root, you find it in dicot plants. So, when the stem starts increasing in its girth, the increase is not only taking place inside the vascular bundle because that's where you find cambium. The increase also takes place outside the steel, extra steel or secondary growth. In fact, it takes place just below the epidermal layer. This results in the formation of the cork cambium. Now, the cork cambium is also called as phylogen. Okay. Now, this phylogen is so if you are looking at the epidermis here, this Region. So, the hypodermal region in the dicot stem is colon chymatis. They undergo dedifferentiation and become meristematic. This is the phylogen. It gives rise to the phelum or the cork outside and the secondary uh, cortex or the phelloderm. So, you have the phelum towards the outside and the phelloderm towards the inside. All these three 
collectively are called as the periderm. Now, what is phelum? Phelum is cork. What is phelloderm? Secondary cortex. All three together is called as the periderm. And what you do find on the cork, the outer region, that is the phelum, is you do find the hard part, that is the bark. Okay, so now let us look at the answer. Periderm includes, is it only bark and cork? No. Is it only cork and cork cambium? No. Is it secondary cortex? No. But is it both B and C? Yes, it is both B and C because periderm includes phelum, that is cork. It includes phelogen, that is cork cambium, and phelloderm, that is the secondary cortex. This will give you an idea of what I just told you. Periderm is nothing but the collective term for secondary cortex, the cork cambium, the cork, and of course the secondary cortex. The periderm is a collective term used for cork, cork cambium, and secondary cortex. Cork is also called phelum and is produced on the outer side by the cork cambium or the phelogen. The phelogen produces secondary cortex or the phelloderm on the inner side. The cells of the phelloderm may be parenchymatous or cholenchymatous in nature. The right answer is both B and C. Let us now solve this question. All the following statements about cork are true except. Now what is cork? Cork is a result of secondary growth happening outside the steel. Just below the epidermis, some of the cells of the cholenchymatous hypodermal region become meristematic and they form the cork cambium, also called as phelogen. This gives rise to, so if I have the cork cambium like this, this is also called as phelogen. This gives rise to cork outside. This cork is also called as phelum. And inside it gives rise to the secondary cortex. Okay, this is called as phelloderm. Now, this cork is made up of cells which are suberized, or rather, there is suberin that is deposited, and this does not allow water, gases, you know, anything to come inside. So, cork is impervious to air and water. So, this is right now what I would like to tell you about cork. So now let us look at the uh, statements. It has the deposition of a fatty substance called as suberin. Yes, this is right, but we need to know the incorrect statement. So this is wrong. It is permeable to water and gases. No, it is not permeable. It is impermeable to water and gases. This is the right answer. It is light in weight and temperature resistant. Yes, all of we, all of us know. How cork is used, in fact, you know, to plug the bottle, you know, champagne bottles and many bottles we use. Cork is very good uh, in uh, resisting. Uh, it's a temperature resistant. And of course, we know that it is light in weight. So this is correct, but not the right option. It is formed from the cells of the cork cambium. Yes, that is correct. But of course, here it is a wrong option. Cork of phelum is formed from the outer cells of cork cambium. Cork cells are arranged in a compact manner and as they mature, their cell wall undergoes deposition of lipophilic substance or fatty. So they attract, you know, they attract, basically have a lot of fat, fatty uh, deposits in it called as suberin. Suberin deposition makes the cell dead and practically impervious to water and gases. Cork is light in weight and floats in water due to lesser density than water. Cork can function as an efficient thermal insulator. Cork cambium is a type of lateral meristem which causes extra stellar secondary growth. So the right answer that the fact that it is permeable to water and gases, cork is not permeable to water and gases, this is incorrect. So this becomes the right answer in all your options.